Okay, physics students, welcome to the second video in topic D2, Stellar Characteristics and Evolution. And in this video, I'm going to talk about, um, I'm going to talk about types of stars and especially Cepheid variables, which are very important for you guys, all right? Okay, so let me get a little bit deeper into the types of stars that are depicted in the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. A little bit more detail about um, main sequence stars, for example. So the main sequence stars, these are 90% of all stars. Our sun, our star, is right in the middle. It's a very typical star. Again, it undergoes stars on the main sequence undergo nuclear fusion of hydrogen into helium. Okay, And generally, these stars are about 70% hydrogen, about 30% helium, and all else have heavier elements. Okay, The giants, which are up in here to the right of the main sequence, are very large and cool. And their luminosities are about 100 times the luminosity of our sun. And so the diameter tends to be about 10 times the diameter of the sun. Okay? In these stars, nuclear fusion of helium converts, uh, converts helium into heavier elements. Now, supergiants, which are even further up to the right of the main sequence, are somewhat rare. They're not, not, relatively not a lot of supergiants. They're very, very large, huge, and very cool. And their diameters are about 1,000 times uh, the diameter of our sun. On the, on the other end, we have white dwarves. Okay, these are red giants at the very end of their lives, and I'll talk about uh, stellar evolution in a later video. Okay, So white dwarves end up shedding their mass. They end up being about Earth size, but they're obviously extremely dense. Um, and they've, they've kind of burned themselves out such that there are no more nuclear reactions in the core. They're very hot, but their small size means that they have a, a very low luminosity. And then variable stars, which I'll talk in more detail, uh, Cepheid variables are variable stars. It turns out the luminosity varies over time. Uh, Cepheid variables, the luminosity varies periodically, which is a very, very important thing in um, astrophysics, which I'll explain. Okay. Now, just to give a sense of the relative sizes of stars, this is, is really, really hard for our, 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 our human minds to, um, to, to kind of get the idea of the distances and the sizes we're dealing with here. So, and there are lots of different kinds of size, stars that we haven't talked about yet. For example, there's a brown dwarf, which is about the size of Jupiter, a neutron star, which is about the size of a large, uh, large city, city. Okay. An average star is about this size. A blue giant is about this much bigger, and a red supergiant are about this much bigger than our sun. So you can see uh, it's pretty astonishing, uh, pretty astonishing uh, diameters of these of these objects. Okay, now. A very special type of variable star is called the Cepheid variable, and these are these are variable stars um, with a luminosity that's very very well defined, and it's very it's very uh, regular. And so there's a period, and it turns out that the period is related to the luminosity. So that can be used to determine the distance to a star. And these periods can be anywhere between 1 and 50 days. And, and um, the reason why there's a variation in luminosity is, is because the star expands and contracts on a regular basis. Okay. Now, other kinds of stars. Binary stars, these are two stars orbiting a common center. We talked about that back when we talked about gravitation a little bit. And a visual binary. Um, where a star appears as two separate stars, okay? And in a visual binary, or a binary star, you have less massive star orbiting the more massive one, but really they orbit each other, okay? And it's the change in luminosity that becomes um, sort of a telltale sign of what's happening, okay? Now, treating the smaller of the two as a satellite of bigger, we have the gm1 m2 over r squared. This should look familiar to you. Equals m2 times omega squared times r, okay? If the masses are similar, um, then this leads to the fact that t squared is proportional to d cubed, okay, which should sound familiar to you if you remember Kepler, okay, where distance, uh, where d is the distance between um, centers. I want you to think about how much this really is related to Kepler or where this equation comes from, okay? All right, eclipsing binary stars. These are super cool. So you have two stars orbiting a common center. They pass in front of one another. One star might be brighter than the other, so the brightness of the overall system can vary, and it makes a regular periodic pattern in luminosity, okay, or uh, apparent brightness. So the light curves show the variations in apparent brightness. So the gray star uh, is brighter in this case, or brighter, and the black star is dimmer, okay. So if you look at this diagram here, right, when you see both stars, you get the greatest brightness, okay. When the big one, which is dimmer, passes in front of the smaller one, which is brighter, 
you get a bigger dip in the brightness against time than you do when the reverse happens. And if you look at this little GIF and really think about what I'm talking about, you're going to get it. We can talk about this a little more in class, okay? You need to be able to sort of interpret what's going on from an apparent brightness against time graph in the IB like this, okay? Um, and we'll do an example. Um, we'll do a more detailed example coming up, all right? As an, as an example of a visual binary, if you consider it having a period of 50 years at a distance of 8.79 light years from Earth, distance between the stars subtends an angle at Earth of 7.56 arc, 7 arc seconds, find the sum of the masses of the stars in this binary system. You might want to pause the video and spend a couple of minutes doing this one before you see my solution. All right. So here's the situation here, right? Here's the arc length, subtending an arc length, right? Okay, these are the two stars, greatly exaggerated, all right? So you want to use radians when solving this problem, okay? So you get that d is 3.05 times 10 to the 12 meters, okay? And then you just use that expression that I derived before for t, um, for the period, uh, let's see, what do we do here? Oh, okay, sorry. I, um, the sum of the masses, so I'm solving for m1 plus m2, so I just, I just rearrange it algebraically, and I get that the sum of the masses is about 3.4 solar masses. So that's how you do it, okay? All right, here's the one I wanted to spend a little time on, the apparent brightness against time, right? So you might be asked to draw the physical binary star system with labeled letters according, according to the light curve below, okay? All right, so I'm going to let, in my diagram, I'm going to let the white star be brighter and the black star be dimmer, okay? Okay, so here's the dim star and, and the bright star, all right? Notice that I have the highest apparent brightness when I can see them both, right? When one is not obscuring the other. The greater dip here, okay, the greater dip is going to be, uh, is going to be when the dimmer star goes in front of the brighter star, right? That's going to be the greater dip, okay? Then here I can see them both right here. Right here, it must be that the brighter star is going in front of the dimmer star, right? Because I have less of an apparent brightness dip and so forth, and that's how the pattern works, okay? So you might be asked to do some sort of sketching um, like that on the IB exam, okay? Okay, and then spectroscopic binaries. Um, these are binary star systems that are detected by periodic Doppler shift of one or the other. So it's so cool, right? If we have a star that's move, if one of them is moving towards the Earth or away from the Earth, we can detect from the um, from the atomic spectra what's happening, and it turns out that there's a periodic shift of those spectral lines to the left and right, and we can deduce what's happening um, with these binary star systems. It's quite remarkable that that um, humans have figured out how to do that. Okay. If lambda naught is the wavelength of the spectral line and lambda is the wavelength received on Earth, then the shift would be the absolute value of the difference between them divided by the wavelength of the spectral line. If the speed of the source is small compared with c, then of course z is approximately equal to uh, v over c. We'll talk a little bit more about that later when we talk about the redshift of the universe. Okay. All right, make sure you go over the document Common Terms in Astrophysics, which I provided to you uh, digitally and familiarize yourself with all those terms. You don't have to memorize them all, but just be familiar with how to use them, okay? All right, example five. The figure shows the spectrum of a spectroscopic binary star system, all right? So you can see the red shift over on this side and a periodic blue shift. Explain qualitatively, again, how it can be deduced that the stars have different masses, okay? And this is how you do it, right? You can draw a diagram. Of course, the IB loves diagrams. The outer star moves faster than the inner one. Um, this is interesting. This is evident from different red and blue shifts that are not the same magnitude, okay? Uh, yes, that is the case, right? This is very interesting. Um, therefore, the inner star must be more massive, okay? Pretty cool stuff. All right, let me talk about Cepheid variables to round out this video. All right, so a Cepheid variable, very important for you to know. These are variable stars whose luminosity varies periodically from days to months. And they're varying, uh, the luminosity is varying due to the outer layers expanding when it becomes brighter and contracting dimmer uh, regularly, okay? And we've seen lots of Cepheid variables. Here's an example of a Cepheid variable getting dimmer and brighter right here. Um, and you can see that this is over the course of, I guess, over a month becoming dimmer and brighter, okay? And a brightness against time diagram uh, would look something like this for a Cepheid variable. Now, you can see that it gets brighter faster than they get dimmer. 
Um, now, why would that be? I want you to think about that and we can maybe discuss that um, in class, all right? Well, it turns out that the longer the period, the greater the luminosity L, okay? Now, many Cepheids are close enough close enough to us to use parala the parallax method to measure their distance. Now, by measuring the, the apparent brightness, it's possible then to calculate the luminosity by this equation that we've used before. And what, what astronomers did was they took, they plotted L against the period for tons and tons of Cepheids, and they saw how they're related, and they saw that, in fact, they are related in such a way. It's a straight line graph when you have a logarithmic graph like this, okay? Now, this relation was discovered in 1908 by a woman named Henrietta Swan Leavitt after investigating and plotting thousands of variable stars. In 1924, Edwin Hubble, who you've probably heard of, used distances to Cepheids in the Andromeda galaxy. He proved that our Milky Way is but one of millions of galaxies. This was a huge breakthrough in astrophysics and really human knowledge um, because um, previously, we didn't have a size, we didn't have an idea of how big the actual universe is, but by proving that our Milky Way is just one of a million, literally, uh, and that the universe is therefore much, much bigger than previously thought, this was a huge sort of paradigm shift in thinking. In 1929, five years later, Hubble again used Cepheids to construct his Hubble's Law, which we'll talk about later, okay? So here's the method. First of all, you determine the period. Number two, you use the, this graph to find the luminosity. And then number three, you use, um, you use our apparent brightness and luminosity and distance to find D. It's actually quite simple, all right? So let's, let's, um, let's take an example here, right? From example six, determine the distance between the Earth and the star whose light curve is shown, okay? So per obviously the period here is about 22 days. And from the graph, all right, we have that L is about seven times... It's about 7,000. Uh, I just want to make sure you guys know how to read log graphs, right? Maybe I'll go over that in class with you guys. Um, uh, but anyway, L is um, about 7,000 solar uh, luminosities. Okay, so L is about 2.7 times 10 to the 30th. Okay, all right. So the next thing we do is uh, we find the brightness, okay? And to find the brightness, we use this equation, which, which comes from the apparent magnitude. Now, um, the magnitude here, you guys don't need to know about magnitudes in the current version of the, um, of the IB curriculum. But note that the average here, and we'll do, and don't worry, we'll do more examples uh, where you don't need to know the magnitude. The average magnitude here is about 3.9, so B is about 6.94 times 10 to the minus 10. And from our equation relating B and L and D, we get that D is about 1,700 light years, which is about 520 parsecs. Pretty cool, okay? All right, how about this one? The period of a Cepheid variable is 10 days, and its brightness is 1 times 10 to the minus 10 watts per square meter. How far is it from Earth? Okay, using the log graph, Okay, you get that L is about 3,000 solar luminosities, and then D equals 3,200 light years. It is this kind of example right here that you will see in the IB, not the one dealing with magnitude.